Remember, Amnesia, the Dark Descent by Mikael Hedberg, illustrations by Rasmus Gunnarsson and Jonas Steinek House of Garrick Alstad has never seen much crime, but there was a dark period spanning from the early winter of 1702 until late summer of 1704. During these years, no less than 39 men were arrested and locked up in Castle Brandenburg's dungeons. In most cases, the criminal's family would be banished from the land, effectively cutting the already dwindling population of Altstadt with 86 souls. The magistrate's office has almost no records detailing these crimes, as most arrests were handled by an unknown nobleman named Wilhelm. Klaus Gottschall, University of Königsberg. The magistrate shuffled through the documents on his desk. Every now and then he would find something, adjust his glasses and try to decipher the century-old handwriting. I don't know what to tell you, Herr Gottschall. Please, call me Klaus. Herr Klaus, there doesn't seem to be much here. I'm aware. The magister leaned back in his chair, waiting for an explanation. Klaus reached into his bag and produced a thick book and placed it on the desk. Are you familiar with Heritage by Ludwig Kleist? The magister feared a long-winded lecture from the historian sitting across the desk. Does it matter? He answered, realizing how rude it must have come off. Klaus looked confused. Can I get you a drink? Continued the magister hoping he could redeem himself. He quickly got up and headed over to a cabinet and fetched two glasses and bottle of liquor. Thank you. It's just that Herr Kleist has done the most thorough investigation into the fate of the house of Gerrick, explained Klaus. Who? The magister began to pour the spirits. Wilhelm, the vigilant was from the house of Gerrick. Ah, of course, said the magister, still confused. I want to pick up where he left off. I see. Where exactly would that be? The book doesn't really reveal what happened to Wilhelm. It only briefly touches on a few of the cases he worked on during his time in Alstad. I want to try to find out what happened to him. They both raised their glasses and nodded in a silent cheers. Fair enough. What can the magistrate office help you with? Two things. I would like to know if there is anything which supports the claim that Wilhelm was working for the Baron of Brennenberg in order to quell the rise of crime. Wilhelm remained unknown by most, and Kleist argues that he might have been working for the Baron to gain influence in higher circles. Well, that I can tell you by simply looking at the wall. The magister stood up and gestured towards a wall of framed documents. These are all the proclamations issued by the Brandenburg barony since the magister went in for a closer look at the document to the far left. Since 1599, and none of them mention such a partnership. Klaus studied the handful of framed documents for a moment. Excuse me, but it doesn't really prove that there was no deal rather that the barony had been a quiet lot. Not quiet, private. If there ever was such a deal, the magistrate's office wouldn't know. My point being, I cannot help you. That's a shame. You could ask for an audience with Baron Alexander. I have, but haven't heard back. Lost in thought, Klaus walked over to the window and looked outside. He watched the people on the town square go about their daily life. This is how he preferred to observe the world, from behind a protective window pane. What was the other thing? asked the magister. Excuse me? Before, you said there were two things you wanted help with. I need the documents concerning the fire. Klaus stepped outside into the square. He took a deep breath, trying to control his discomfort. His eyes jumped across the scene, the laughing young women carrying bags of flour to the bakery, the boy bringing out one of the horses in front of the inn, the priest waving to an elderly woman, 
Klaus turned his head towards the sky and took another deep breath. Open spaces always made him nervous. He knew it was silly, but he couldn't control it. Klaus hurried over to the carriage and climbed inside. The carriage headed south in search for the old farmstead described in the documents. On Thursday, 28th of September, 1704, there was a fire which consumed a barn a few miles south of Altstadt. It was Wilhelm's last case. The documents procured from the magistrate office contains a handful of testimonies from witnesses, but it lacks a final statement from Wilhelm. The fates of Wilhelm and the arsonist had never been fully disclosed. A sheriff from Königsberg was sent to investigate Wilhelm's endeavors, but he returned early winter 1704, reporting that crimes had dropped in Alstad and that there was no trace of the nobleman. Ludwig Kleist, the author of Heritage, goes to assume the best for all parties. It stands to reason that we lack information about half of Wilhelm's life. In 1704, when he was but 34 years old, we find the last documents detailing his efforts. Wilhelm had for two years been working for Baron Alexander of Brandenburg as a secret lawman. Baron Alexander, being a knight of the prestigious Order of the Black Eagle, must have realized that a rising crime could not be left to the magistrate and the sheriffs in Königsberg, and acquired assistance from the decorated soldier from Kerik. This arrangement was most likely not administered by the king, at least not officially, and if investigated would fall apart from a legal standpoint. In 1704, a sheriff from Königsberg was sent to Alstad to question Wilhelm about the civil arrests he had undertaken. It seems safe to assume that Wilhelm was made to cease his efforts, but was allowed to leave on his own accord, as no documents details this meeting. Considering that the arrival of the sheriff coincides with Wilhelm's last case, this fact seems glaringly obvious. Excerpt from Heritage, Ludwig Kleist. The carriage turned up a smaller dirt road. Klaus couldn't read any longer as the car started to bob from side to side. He thought about Kleist's words. He really enjoyed reading Heritage, but there was just so much speculation. Master Gutschall, we have arrived, called the driver. Klaus took a breath and went outside. Countrysides didn't bother him as much. As long as there wasn't too many people around, he could relax. There were two houses standing and one being built. One of the men working crossed the yard and approached the carriage. Hey there, Herr Stoss? asked Klaus. No, there is no Stoss around here. My name is Zimmermann. I see. Do you mind if I look around? I'm from Königsberg. I'm investigating the fire. Fire? Yes, in 1704 there was a large fire here. Zimmermann laughed. 1704? That's almost 70 years ago. Yes, I'm well aware. Of course, come. Zimmerman was still holding back his laughter. What's your name, Sheriff? Klaus, but I'm not a sheriff, I'm a historian. Now that sounds about right. The side of the fire was considered too much of a hassle to clear, as it was still littered with pieces of burned wood. Zimmerman wasn't concerned, as it worked just fine as a pasture. Klaus wasn't sure what he was looking for, but was hoping he would turn up something. He looked around the grassland, towards the forest, and back at the farmstead. The men were working on the house, while the driver had lit a pipe. What am I doing, he thought. He looked at the documents, detailing the event again. He tried to imagine it play out in front of him. The two standing houses were most likely from Stoss's farm. Klaus was standing where the barn stood. The farmhand, named Emil, torched the barn with his master inside. The fire quickly spread. Wait a minute. The barn was really large. This must have taken a long time. How come the farmer didn't save himself? And how did Wilhelm show up so quickly? Wilhelm knew Emil was up to no good. He had one of his men follow Emil that night and caught him as he torched the barn. After alerting the family, Wilhelm's man had fetched his master to arrest Emil. 
The Statement of Dorothea Stoss Klaas returned to Alstad. His own suspicions was as unfounded as Christ's fairy tale, but there was something strange about the whole ordeal. He pushed open the heavy door, leading into the church. The priest was lighting some candles as the cloudy afternoon left the church in the dark. Father? called Klaus. Welcome, my son. I need your help. God answers those who pray. Well, yes, this is more worldly. I need insight into the church records. I need to know what happened to Dorothea Stoss. Happened to her? Whatever do you mean? I need to know what happened to the farm after the fire, pressed Klaus. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but Dorothea lived with her daughter Anna for years here in Alstad. She passed away, must have been 15 or 20 years ago. Her daughter? Is she still alive? Dorothea's daughter Anna married into the Koch family in 1718 and moved away from the farmstead. A little more than a decade later, Dorothea moved in with Anna. The farmstead fell into disuse and the land was left unattended for 20 years until it was sold after Dorothea's death. Klaas smiled at the treasure trove of information the church archives turned out to be, but there was still little about the actual event or any traces of Emil the farmhand. There was only one way to go, he had to find Anna Koch and hope she had something to say. She was six at the time of the fire, and with a bit of luck, the event had made an impression on her. Klaus went outside into the square. He followed the side so he didn't have to cross it. He felt enough excitement already. He didn't need another panic attack. He turned down the side street and dodged a farmer with a cut of turnips, heading into town. Anna was a fairly wealthy widow, living with a maid in a modest but well-kept townhouse. Klaus straightened his jacket, brushed off dust from his sleeves, and knocked on the door. The maid opening the door was a cheerful, middle-aged woman. Klaus was invited inside. May I offer you something to drink? Are you hungry? Thank you, but no thank you. I was hoping to see Anna Koch. Of course, come this way. The maid showed Klaus into the upstairs drawing room. Anna sat in a rocking chair facing the oriel window. The room was decorated with paintings and porcelain. A fine carpet was splayed across the polished wooden floor. The fireplace cracked comfortingly and immersed the room in a warm glow. Anna, said the maid, this young man wanted to see you. Would that be all right? Yes, of course. What can I do for you? Frau Koch, my name is Klaus Gottschall. I'm from the university in Königsberg. May I ask you a few questions? Please, have a seat. Klaus sat down on a robust chair next to her. He looked outside the window. The street outside was nothing but ordinary. One-story houses lined the opposite side of the street. A single sign belonging to the town's cobbler was the only thing breaking the monotony of residential homes. I like watching the world go by, said Anna. I feel the same. They sat for a moment, watching the street below and the forest beyond the town. The sun was setting and the waning moon was rising. Do you remember the fire at the farm? Oh dear, I haven't thought about that for years. Why do you ask? I'm trying to find out what happened to Wilhelm and the farmhand. Emil, she jumped in. He was such a sweet man. Really? I'm surprised you would say that. How so? He killed your father. Don't be ridiculous. Sometimes Emil had to sleep alone inside the barn. He was 20 years of age, but still afraid of the dark. So I would sneak him some lamp oil he could burn in a tin bowl. He fell asleep with the fire still burning. Later he woke up screaming his lungs out. The barn was on fire. The entire family quickly gathered in the yard. But father being the man he was, 
decided he was going to save the animals inside. As you well know, he never came out. Emil was crying hysterically. I tried to comfort him, as I didn't yet realize what had happened. Later, that Wilhelm fellow arrived with his men, telling Emil that he would have to come with them. Us children were sent inside, but mother spoke to the lawman and later wrote a statement to the magister in town. Anna Koch, formerly Stoss. Whatever happened to Emil? Oh, I would say he was rebuked in some manner, but it was an accident and everyone knew so. I can't imagine him being punished except by his own sense of guilt. Klaas considered telling Anna about the harsh words her mother had written about Emil. They most certainly would have him sentenced to a few years in prison. What could he possibly gain from telling her, and what would she do with such information? Klaas decided to keep his words to himself. What is left, he thought. There is only one more place to go. Castle Brennenburg. As Klaus's carriage rolled through the main gate and into Brennenburg's courtyard, he got the sense of abandonment. Everything was so quiet and serene. Did anyone really live here? Klaus shut the carriage door behind him and looked around. The courtyard was paved with cobblestone, not the rigid square form like at the university in Königsberg, but the more natural stone found on a rocky seashore. The castle towered in front of him, a magnificent gothic structure with distinct windows and elaborate parapets. Shall I wait, sir? asked the driver. Please, I shan't be long, answered Klaas. He made his way to a large gate and tapped the heavy door knocker with as much grace as he could. <laughs>